Muslim speaker, Dr. Abdul Haidu. front of you today to share some thoughts on the Islamic aspect of family mm. and as a well, my apology for missing out last September forum <coughs> when I had to be away that week so I could not uh, oh, but attend you today. and uh, sacrificing Saturday evening especially when the leaves are in the playoff I don't think the lucky guy is sitting here who would be at the <laughs> Canada Center for the tickets. <laughs> but uh, I hope we can get out before the game starts. <laughs> anyway, that we won. It is not since uh, 68, 7 that we haven't won the cup? 67. 67, yeah. And uh, it's about time that the Stanley Cup comes to Trump. So I hope this gathering prayers will be answered. <laughs> so, uh, Speaking on the uh, family in Islam, I would say that uh, it's uh, an institution that is very similar to what the, all the Abrahamic faith and even the other faiths have defined and valued over the years. From the time of creation as Muslims, Christians, and Jews believe, from the creation of Adam, as we heard already the first human being, and the, uh, he was given a companion a female companion, Eve, to which God has defined what family is supposed to be. And the Quran speaks of this uh, family as a unit <coughs> in the uh, one chapter called the uh, Rome. Uh, it says that, I will just read in Arabic for my Muslim brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, uh, one, before I do that, the uh, creation that God has said, Ya ya nasu inna khalaqnaakum in zakari wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shawgun wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna framakum inna Allah ya ta'ala inna Allah alimun khabir. O mankind, Lord, we have created you from male and female and have made you nations and tribes that ye may know one another. Lord, the noblest of you in the sight of God is the best in conduct. Lord God is the knower, aware of everything. So here, the creation of human beings is designed that God has created us into male and female, and made us into different nations, tribes, so that we may know each other as a diversity that is defined here, which is to be valued, that divinely created diversity that we must respect. And the other part of the institution of family, and to the end, means that God has created you and made, female, made uh, spouses for you, that is the male and female, so that you may dwell in tranquility, but before that God says one important thing, that he has the Arabic speaking people would know what I'm referring to here. That he has not just said that male and female coming together, but he has planted mercy, love, into the hearts of the people, both male and female. Wow. And when I perform marriage ceremony, I always say that that mercy is resident in our cells, our body, our heart, and it is uh, generated depending on our relationship with God. And the best example I can give in today's context as a former IT person myself is, you have a zip file and you unzip that. And how the zip file explodes. So that when uh, the explosion depends on the size of the file. This file is enormous, the file of mercy. But depending on your relationship with God and how you want to make this relationship work together, that is what it will depend on that mercy is generated so that throughout the married life as a family, 
you can dwell in tranquility and peace together. And this is what God is, the definition of marriage in Islam is. At the time of the marriage ceremony, God had chosen certain uh, prophets, rather, uh, peace be upon him. He, he chose some verses to recite as a blessing, the, the union of the two people. And a couple of those verses indicate that how your relationship is going to be. And one of the verses said that, uh, Ya Allah, wa taqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antu muslim. One my Muslim uh, brothers and sisters will recall hearing this verse at the time of their marriage ceremony. That once emphasizing here is to be conscious, remain conscious of God in your life while you are living as a husband and wife and that you must maintain honesty. Your relationship will depend, the existence of your relationship will depend on the honesty, how honest you are with each other. And then the other part that it says, and live the life of, as a Muslim means live life as a submitter to God's will. Muslim is one who submits to God's will. So here, it's, one means live the life as a submitter of God's will. And then another verse he chose the opening chapter of Surah Women means that he has created you from multitude of people, from Adam and Eve. And one of the parts that is there that don't forget, don't severe the relationship from the one that bore you. Means that the, you don't, in other words, by getting married together or living as husband and wife, doesn't mean that you are cutting off relationship with your parents, with your mother especially. The umbilical cord is cut at first, but you have your relationship is there forever. And even by marriage, you don't severe that relationship, which is a very good message given in the Quran. And the Prophet chose that verse to recite at the time of the marriage ceremony. And one of the other verses that recited, recited was the uh, in which uh, I'll just translate to in uh, rather than reading in the Arabic, is that um, you maintain your community, be straight to the point, talk straight to the point, be direct in your speech. Communication is the most important basis for a successful marriage. So here God says that that, is, that applies to all. But especially in a married life as a family, you have to have that openness, that open communication with each other. So these verses are recited, chosen by Prophet, uh, apart from along with other two verses I recited earlier. And depending on the time, he would recite two or three verses and explain that, yes, this is important. We are embarking on a new relationship as a family. That will, you will have children, how to live them. And then some duties of husband and wife are defined in, uh, from the Islamic perspective. They are similar to, you will find the same thing in other faiths as well. Is because most religions have a common thread with family life. That is Except that the family institution of family, now the definition is changing now in this country. And about 14 states, I think, in US as, and number of countries in Europe. I will not go into that debate at this time over here. I'm speaking from the Islamic perspective uh, of what a family is. And the duties of husband is to give mahar at the time of wedding means that it's not a dowry, but it's a gift to wife, which is her property. And it can be any amount. There is no upper limit or lower limit. And that must be paid by the husband. It remains a debt on the husband all his life, that mahar, that amount. In time of divorce, he has to pay that as well, unless she forgives that. Next thing is to treat his wife with kindness and respect, to provide his wife and family with food, shelter, clothing, and other necessity, to fulfill his role as a father to his children, to consult his wife before making any family major decisions. Consultation is important. To marry up to four wives, provided he abides by all conditions. And this is a tricky question that comes up most of the time in Muslim. Yes, it is a privilege. It is not a necessity. It is not that they must have. It is a lot of conditions. There are a lot of conditions that you must have before you acquire that and for living together with them as well. The duties of wife to accept or reject any marriage proposals. In Islam, 
the woman is asked first whether she wants to marry, take this person as a husband or not. If she says no, no marriage takes place. So woman's consent is important. Now, the fact what has happened over the years in many different Islam spread to many corners of the world and many cultural practices came into the Muslim way of life. And therefore in some cultures even to this day, uh, women's consent is not taken by the parents. What, what is known as arranged marriage. Well, arranged marriage has two different definitions. One is to help choose a mate, but the other one is to say, okay, I have chosen this mate for you, no questions asked. Some uh, men even are, fall into that category, that yes, man has to say, okay, if you have chosen, I have no problem. That is a cultural practice, not a religious In Islam. The woman consent has to be taken first, and if she says no, no marriage takes place. The, among the other duties to receive mahar, which I explained, to be provided, and that amount has to be agreed by the wife. It is not the father can demand, or the mother can demand, or the family can demand. She has to agree that yes, he, the husband, has agreed to pay me this as a gift, whether it is 2,000, 5,000, and I say it is based on the cost of living in each country rather than a fixed amount from a home country or fixed on anything like uh, other way. To be provided with food, shelter, and clothing. The wife uh, to be treated by her husband with kindness and respect. To possess personal property, she can own her own property and whatever she earns is her own. Husband has no share in it. On the other hand, wife has a share in husband's assets. But the husband has no share in wife's assets unless she decides to give to him anything. Acquire education and to seek employment. And the prophet said in, a, uh, in his, one of his saying, that and I recited this in Arabic just for our Muslim brothers and sisters that he used the word both Muslim and male and female the acquisition of education is compulsory on both male and female to use, not just say on human being or any person professing faith and a wife uh, right is to possess personal property education and to seek employment as well she can seek employment uh, also. To manage house and her household affairs, to fulfill her role as a mother to her children, to abide by any decisions made jointly, to seek divorce in any of the following, she has right to seek divorce as well, in any of the following situation. If the husband chooses to marry another woman, she has right to seek divorce. If there is a physical or emotional abuse, then she has right to seek divorce and also on importance as well of the husband. These are some of the things, duties of husband and wife as a family in Islam. Now quickly I'll just go through. There are a number of other aspects of family that what do, like mothers for example. And God said, and we have enjoined upon man concerning his parents, his mother bears him in weakness upon weakness, and his weaning is in two years. Give thanks unto me and to thy parents, unto me is the journey. But for two years the mother can nurse the child. Uh, that God has said here. As for the children, uh, wealth and children are ornaments, or these are Quranic verses that I'm quoting, um, speaking, uh, skipping the Arabic one. Wealth and children are an ornament of the life of the world, but the good deeds which endure are better in thy Lord's sight for reward and better in respect of hope. J children are described as jewels, how we protect our jewels. So we need to be mindful and protect our children from all, uh, all forces. That can really cause problem in life. And then, and they assign unto God daughters, be he glorified and unto themselves what they desire. <coughs> and if one of them receive tidings of a birth of a female, his face remain darkened, wow. and he is worse, cross in worse. <coughs> he hides himself from the folk because of the evil that whereof he has heard tidings. After hearing the birth of a daughter, many, God says, people, uh, there was a tradition in Arabia too and is still prevailing in many parts of the world and that they don't want us to say they feel sorry, distressed when a daughter is born. And the Prophet said in his speech that anyone who has three daughters and who brought them up uh, properly, heaven, uh, the gates of heaven are open for them, for that person. So someone asked, what about two daughters? He said, yes, two also. It applies to one also. In other words, means honoring the female child, not to uh, dishonor them as is the practice is still prevailing in some parts of the Muslim world about uh, infanticide and infanticide was prevailing 
burying the girls alive in Arabia, pre-Islamic Arabia, as well as well as it is today. Still, the girls are in the name of what is called honor killing. Uh, they are killed, but that is not Islam. Islam is of course that Quran says, as I read the verses to you, and then. The other aspect of uh, family life is in the case of a divorce that God has also spelled out an inheritance part. When we, you have divorced women and they have reached their term, they retain them in kindness or release them in kindness. Retain them not in their hurt so that you transgress the limit. He who does that wrong his soul. Make not the revelations of God a laughing stock. Your behavior, but remember, God's grace is upon you that we, he has revealed unto you of the scripture and wisdom. So divorce is the most despised thing in the sight of God. And it should, it should not go that route. However, there are circumstances where separation is inevitable. <coughs> and uh, like I just received a call before I came here about a marital problem about, uh, and it's a messy divorce that they are going through. Uh, so. People, sometimes they don't think which route they are taking. And uh, a couple of years ago, a year before last, I was part of a task force in Ontario here, consultation in the task force about how to make divorce easy in Ontario courts, just to give you an example. And uh, the uh, task force recommended, we recommended that there should be pre-mediation before you go to court, that let them know what is involved, what will be expected. So in Brampton and Milton, pilot projects were started by the then Attorney General in Ontario about two years ago. And it's still, I think, uh, it's not available throughout uh, Ontario as such. But um, the, uh, one of the uh, documentary, one of the movie clips that was shown to the divorcing couple, that before you divorce, come and see this uh, little bit of a movie clip in which a cow is there, the husband pulling the head wife pulling the tail of the cow, lawyer is milking the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and the children who stand in there watching. <laughs> and in, while he is milking the cow, he takes some directly into his mouth. <laughs> from the <laughs> so he said, this is, what, is uh, what happens in the courts these days, with due respect to any lawyer sitting here in the court. <laughs> But the idea was to make divorce easy instead of the messy divorce that is going through. So as a mediator myself, I uh, serve as a former a human rights commissioner in this province also, besides being a faith leader. So I know that uh, people go through many messy divorces and so on. So God has spelled out conditions on mediation, that first try mediation as well. And in other verses, I don't have time to go through all that. Uh, and the, uh, so. We had also custody of the children, everything, all this is spelled out in the Quran that uh, we have. I don't want to take much of your time because you will have many questions in which more information will be brought out. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts on family life in Islam. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Patel. So now I'd like to ask... Uh your pictures, it won't be going to the police station. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you see me as, as in uniform, just come and say me, hello, I'm a chaplain with your bridge or police. Uh, I also wear uniform. <laughs> 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 yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just okay, I'd like to call on uh, Reverend Tony Zechfeld to uh, come up and yeah, present the Christian side of this talk. Um, sorry, if anyone wants to fall under me, they will. As with uh, <coughs> Dr. Patel, I'm a little thankful that I could be here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, as soon as it uh, was suggested that we have a topic like marriage in the family. I thought we could be here for a long time because it's a big topic, it's a huge topic. And so what I've done is uh, divided it into three parts. How marriage was in the beginning. And the second part I want to look at 
what happened? What went wrong? And then the third part, how can it be fixed? <coughs> respect to uh, marriage and family today. Okay. So really the question I was asked to answer is what does the Bible, what does the Holy Bible say about marriage and the family? And so what we do first of all is we want to look at what Genesis says. That's the very first book of the Holy Bible. It's called Genesis. And in Genesis, we read there that uh, God made marriage. And God created it, uh, not man. So marriage, a lot of people will say today, well, marriage is just a man-made custom. Not so. God made marriage, and he made it to be something very, very beautiful. And it's very interesting that in the second chapter of Genesis, God tells us how he brought the woman to the man. You could say he officiated at the wedding ceremony. And I'm going to read those few verses from Genesis. It says here, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper. And the Lord God, what did he do? He caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in his place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken for a man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And then, after that, after the Lord brings the woman to the man, after the Lord brings the woman to Adam, Adam sings a song. I don't know if everyone sings songs at their weddings. I know we did. We sang a song. And Adam also sang a song because he was just joyous at how the Lord had given, given him the gift of a wife. And what was the song? It's this. Found in Genesis 2. He sings. This is now bone of my bones. I can't sing, so I'm going to read it. And flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then after that, there's a conclusion. The Bible says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. We have a rhyme in the English that says, Leaving, cleaving, weaving. <laughs> right? So leaving, the boy and the girl both leave their parents, they cleave together, and they weave. That's the family unit. And just three comments about how God made marriage from the beginning. Three things I want to say from the Bible. God made marriage beautiful. He made marriage in such a way that there would be true love between husband and wife, and one would give himself herself to the other. According to the Bible, marriage is between one man and one woman oh. to the exclusion of all others for life. You know, God never intended that a man be married to more than one woman. That's from the beginning. God never intended that a woman be married to more than one man. But it's another thing. The Bible, God never intended that a man marry a man. And God never intended that a woman marry a woman. God forbids this in the Bible. That's the first thing. So God made marriage beautiful between a man and a woman. One man and one woman. But the second thing we want to see here from the Bible is God made marriage for two reasons. First of all, for companionship. And I know Dr. Abdul mentioned that either earlier too. It's for companionship. But notice what the Lord says here. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. Having a dog or a cat will never compensate for loneliness. Ultimately, God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So companionship is the very first reason primary reason. And the second reason 
the Bible says is to have children. Oh. Lots of children. When God made Adam and Eve, he blessed them. And what did he say? Be fruitful and multiply. What do follow? At the that he knew far away. Right? Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's the second thing. Right? And then the third thing is, God made man to be the head, to be the leader in the marriage relationship and in the family. Now, let's be very clear. Both men and women are equal. Because when God made woman from the man, he didn't make her from the foot of Adam, or from the head of Adam, but from the side of Adam. Mama. And he made her to complete him. Right? Together they are one flesh. So together they complete, she completes him. So the husband is not higher than the wife. The husband is not more important than the wife. But knowing this, the Bible also says, God calls the husband to be the loving leader, the provider, the breadwinner in the family, in the relationship. And his wife should stand by him and behind him and support him. The Bible says it this way, for the husband is the head of the wife. Right? And in this way, the relationship, the relationship in marriage, the relationship between husband and wife, was to mirror, was to reflect in a really beautiful way the relationship between God and his people. So that's the way it was in the very beginning. God created marriage something to be very beautiful, where the husband gave himself to his wife, and the wife gave herself to her husband. What happened? Something went wrong. And I think we all know that just as we look in the world around us. Well, what's the root cause for all the messy divorces? We were hearing about messy divorces. What's the root cause of that? The root cause, according to the Bible, is that man has a broken relationship with God. God created man. God made us so that we could have a relationship with him, fellowship with him. And man broke it by disobeying God. And we see the terrible consequences all around it. When this is broken, this is also broken. And we can mention divorce. We can mention multiple wives, multiple husbands. We can mention same-sex marriage. Many other things. The glory of God has been tarnished, has been spoiled. His beauty is marred. But you know, we can mention those things, but the corruption goes much deeper than that. We can, it's easy to mention those kinds of sins, but it goes a lot deeper than that. I think we just have to look at our own hearts. The corruption of man is so deep that in ourselves, we're, we are unable to restrain our tongue. The Bible calls the tongue as a, a world of evil. Sometimes we're unable to restrain our hands. Witness the abuse. We are so corrupt by nature that we cannot restrain our evil desires and lusts. Jesus knows that. And that's why Jesus says, he says, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. Corruption goes so deep into our human nature, doesn't it? When you think about it, often we don't think about the fact that we, with our hearts, stand before God, we're accountable before Him, he sees our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows us better than we know ourselves. You know, behind our suits, behind behind our ties, our ties are dark dragons. The dark dragons 
in the closet of our hearts. Inflamed passions, fiery <coughs> venom, devouring appetites. Think of the dragon. Our ego is big, isn't it? It's self-seeking, it's self-centered, it's self-serving. You know, and sometimes a primary way that it shows is in the marriage relationship. That, that the ugliness sometimes comes to its worst expression in a relationship between husband and wife. We think of that illustration of the cow. Well, how true. Right? A husband, I mean, think that there's, I would say there's two extremes that we see in our world today of how that conflict shows itself in a, in a tug of war situation. There's two extremes. One extreme is the husband easily misuses the gift that God has given to him. What is that gift? The gift to, to lead in his family. A husband easily misuses his God-given authority by abusing his wife and his children. Sometimes he will verbally abuse his wife. Sometimes he may hit or slap or beat his wife. This is wrong. Above all, it dishonors God. It dishonors the marriage covenant. And it's bad teaching for the children in the home. God intended, God intended to use God intended husbands to use their physical strength to protect their wives, not to injure them, not to harm them. That's the one thing. That's one extreme. The other extreme is a wife can easily covet, can easily wrongfully desire her husband's authority. <laughs> she may become resentful, to the point that she doesn't want to listen to her husband anymore, doesn't want to submit to him. And so she begins to protest the beautiful role that God has given her, that of being a helper to her husband. And so what happens? If the husband is weak, the husband gives up his leadership, gives up the gift that God has given, it to, given to him, and he hands it over to his wife. <laughs> That's not the way God meant it to be. That too dishonors God. That too dishonors the marriage covenant. This too is really bad teaching for children in the home. God made marriage. God made it to be beautiful. He made it to be a blessing for a family. He made marriage to be a blessing to human society. The Bible also shows that when we do not follow his blessed way for marriage, what happens? It becomes ugly. And then what happens? There's envy, there's sadness, there's anger, there's grief, there's misery. Those things enter. That's the, the state that the natural person finds himself in. But the question is, how can it be fixed? How can it be what how can it become again what God made it to be? Well, for the first, in the first place, those dark dragons inside of us, those dark, dark dragons in the secrecy of our hearts, like lust, like pride, like envy, they need to be killed. They need to be slain. And they need to be replaced with Love, sacrifice, and life. And according to the Bible, there's only one who can kill it inside of us. And that's Jesus. He's the only one who has the power to kill those terrible dragons of sin inside of us. And he modeled that. By giving himself up, right? With the Father, with God the Father from all eternity, he gave himself up as a sacrifice on the cross, taking the sentence in our place. In 
the place of sinners like us. And God accepts his sacrifice. Not our sacrifice. We have no sacrifice to give him. God accepts his sacrificing. That's proven by the fact that Christ arose from the dead on the third day. No. This Lord Jesus Christ. He restores. He fixes. He forgives. That's the beautiful thing of the forgiveness that God provides in Jesus. He wipes away the past. Whatever those horrible things that have been done. He wipes it away and replaces it with something brand new. How does it look like now when Jesus changes us? What's it look like? What does the marriage relationship look like? Well, the Bible says two things. First of all, a husband, we look at what the husband, uh, how the husband uh, relates to his wife, then how the wife relates to the husband. First of all, a husband now begins to exercise his leadership in the family in a loving way. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians, in the New Testament, Apostle Paul, he says, Husbands, love your wives. Well, how should they love their wives? Well, he says like this, Just as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right? Jesus loves the church so much that he gave his life up for her. That's how Jesus exercises his authority over the church. By giving himself up for her. By laying down his life for her. He bought her. He paid the price for her. And now he nurtures her. He protects her. He feeds her. He guides her. He leads her with perfection. That's how Jesus guides and leads the believing congregation. And he has the aim of making her beautiful. <clears throat> and the Bible says, so the husband should be for the wife. The aim of the husband too, is, to, is to make her beautiful by the grace of God. That's the first part. The second part is this. A wife now begins to, as the Bible says, submit willingly to her husband from the heart. So the Bible says, the Bible says this, as wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Well, how should a wife obey her husband? How should a wife submit to her husband? Well, like this. Just as the church, just as the believing children of the Lord, of Jesus, is subject to Christ. Like that. You know when a husband really loves his wife? From the heart, a wife can really trust him. <clears throat> a wife can trust his leadership without fear, with a willingness to say, yes, I trust that you will lead me. I trust you will protect me. In conclusion, you see, outside of a relationship <laughs> with Jesus, the laws in marriage, the order in marriage becomes harsh. Aww. The home, the family, is then only a regime. Outside of a relationship with Jesus, husbands can sometimes only become bosses. They become dictators. Their wives submit, but not out of love, but because they're very afraid. They're fearful. They obey, but they don't really obey from the heart. There's frustration. There's joy. But in the context of a relationship with Jesus, God's law, God's order in marriage relationship becomes a way of showing Christ-like love. Love is at the heart of our relationship with the Lord God and with all our family relationships. That love then is willing to uh, show itself by wanting to um, exemplify what, what God says in the Bible. In the context of the relationship in Christ, it's then that children in the family grow and thrive in that environment. In this way, children learn to show real love to their parents from the heart. And that real love will show in a deep respect for mom and dad, 
for a great mom and dad. It'll show in their honor for them. No doubt, children need to be disciplined. Sometimes spanked, according to the Bible. Sometimes they need to be spanked, when they, especially when they disobey their parents. But it's not to hurt or to injure, but it's always with the loving hand of discipline. But in this way, children learn to properly respect also not only their own parents, but other authorities. They learn to show respect to the teacher in the classroom, to the police officer in the streets, to their employer at work. This, dear friends, is the fruit. This is really the fruit. The beauty of marriage is really the fruit of true faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one who restores the gift. And we now are accept that in faith. When we accept that in faith, that gift is restored to us. Such a marriage and family is according to God's word. And such a marriage is a happy marriage. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Reverend Zachfeld. So I'll invite both speakers to come and have a seat. And uh, so we've come to the question and answer period. So there's some uh, pieces of paper being uh, handed out. So you can write your question on that. And then uh, somebody will be around to clap. That's a good point. There should be only questions related to the topic that was spoken. here for uh, Dr. Abdul. Does the husband ever have the right to strike or hit his wife according to the Quran? And if he does, under what circumstances? Thank you for question. this question. Uh, there's 
one verse in the Quran. That people misinterpret and say this, we are commanded to hit the wife, what we go on. It doesn't translate into beating or anything like that. Without going into the detail, the husband has no authority to beat the wife. In a sense. He is considered abuse. The Prophet Muhammad, he said in the example, the Quran speaks of family life, to follow the example of the Prophet. And he says, do not hit your wife, do not abuse your wife. And I am the best of husband to my wife. So that was his, uh, that his character. He never hit a wife and we are not commanded to hit or beat the wife. Or women, for that matter. And spanking children is another story. <coughs> we have another question for Dr. <coughs> In the case of divorce, should Islamic law or Canadian law be applied? Both. Islamic law I mean, stipulates please, divorce please, 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 please. question. <laughs> In the case of divorce, should Islamic law or Canadian law be applied? Islamic law is such that a husband can divorce the wife by reciting three times that I divorce you and she is divorced. Now that is the theological <coughs> As far as the legal law is concerned, she is still considered wife in the Canadian context. So she has to both have to go through the court to, to get the marriage annulled. So having court divorce, a legal divorce, does not always mean that she is divorced. Depending on if the husband signs that I divorce with this paper or I hereby divorce my wife, that is considered acceptable, so then no other Islamic divorce is to be pronounced. So quite often what happens in Muslim families, and this is from the experience I speak, sometimes the husband says, I have right to divorce, and if you cannot be mine, nobody else, you cannot be, belong to anybody else either. So I'll keep you hostage for the rest of your life. That is not permitted in Islam. She has right to seek divorce, as I said, in the court system, in uh, Muslim countries where Islamic law is applied, there is a Qadi, there is an Islamic judge who hears them and they can settle the divorce, then he has to give the divorce. And the other way that if he refuses, the judge has right to annul the marriage. Here in Canada, we don't have a uh, state-appointed Islamic jurist or judge. So what we have is a tribunal that hears the complaints, a wife seeking divorce, and if the husband refuses to pronounce Islamic divorce, then we uh, find enough ground to annul the marriage uh, that yes, this can be annulled. But the legal divorce precedes all others that yes, the person, that person cannot marry in Canada unless court annuls the marriage. <coughs> question for Pastor Tony, where is polygamy prohibited in the scripture? Hmm. I was thinking that question might come. Can I, you know, I'm just going to take this out. Hey? Yeah. Uh, certainly there are examples in the scripture, in the Bible, of polygamy. We know that Abraham had more than one wife. Solomon had many wives. But it's very clear that God never intended this from the very beginning. It's very clear that it's uh, one man, one woman. And Jesus himself also echoes that in Matthew 19. He presupposes that this is the norm for marriage. Jesus talks about how um, uh, one man, God created that one man, married one wife, one woman. And uh, that's also in the context of the uh, discussion on divorce. But the assumption all throughout scripture is this is the norm, this is the pattern for the human family. And you could say then that Abraham departed from that pattern, that norm. And so does Solomon. And with that, 
there was also great grief in their families. Much jealousy, envy, and all kinds of strife that came along with that. I'll just leave it like this. If I'm allowed to add a little bit more than what I said about the uh, polygamy in Islam, it is a privilege, not a directive that they must have, number one. Second thing is, under, uh, in the pre-Islamic Arabia, as it came from many different traditions, people were having multiple wives, Islam limited to four. And that, you can marry second, third, only if you can do justice. Quran is very clear about that. If you cannot do justice, treat them equally, then marry only one, Quran says. So that is what most Muslims do. Uh, in some cultures, it is common practice to have more than one, and that is still prevailing. But they have to do, they are answerable to God for doing any injustices that they may be doing. So it is not a directive that they must have. Uh, I remember one of the, uh, our political leader's prayer, of one time you were talking, and he said, oh, you know what I like about Islam is to have uh, more than one wife. I said, don't let your wife hear this, and don't claim it in her income tax. <laughs> so people make fun of the polygamy, but it is uh, not normally practiced in many countries, but is, as I said, in case of war, when there are a lot of widows to be taken care of, or in case of illness or impotence or other reasons, then that privilege is given there to have a second or third wife. A question for Pastor Tony. <clears throat> if marriage falls apart between a husband and wife, what is the instruction from Jesus? <clears throat> marriage falls apart between husband and wife, what's the instruction from Jesus? Well, it depends why the marriage falls apart between husband and wife. Because Jesus does say that um, he does give an exception on the grounds of adultery. If there's a husband that uh, has an affair with another lady, or a wife has an affair with another man, that is grounds for a proper divorce. Um, other than that, Jesus would say, um, first of all, try to bring reconciliation into the marriage. And that's, and that's what Christians seek to do. They seek to bring both parties together, both husband and wife to come together, counsel them, and know that in Christ, uh, difficulties can be overcome. Sometimes, Difficulties that seem so impossible, they can be overcome by the grace of God. So the, the first route is always to seek full reconciliation. Right? And having said that, there are, of course, situations where the marriages do fall apart. And even then, you know, we need to go to God and uh, realize that um, it's sinful, but also go to Him knowing that he truly, and indeed, he truly forgives if we're truly sorry for um, a situation in marriage that we have not done right. God truly forgives and he restores the sinner again too. But it doesn't mean that the consequences go away. The consequences often remain, right? There's often um, hardships that may come or fall with that. Dr. Abdul, why in Islam only can men marry four women and not vice versa? That's the law of nature. You heard from our dear friend Reverend as well that only one wife of uh, women can uh, God created woman after creating man as a companion. If I can reason this from this angle, that is to marry one only, not a multiple way. There are many other natural and practical problems that generate from having more than one. There is one community, actually, I don't know if you know, this is in the Himalayas, an area called Ladakh, north uh, western India. 
that uh, where they have uh, what is practiced as polyandry, opposite of polygamy, that women have multiple husbands there. And that society, I don't know if anybody has done any research on it or how the problems, but it is not the norm in many parts of the world that they have women can have more than one husband and is unnatural in many ways, especially when related to children how the responsibility can be divided between the two. And that also reflects the biblical teaching and the uh, Jewish scripture as well. Another one for Dr. Abdul, and this one's kind of related maybe as well. Why can a Muslim man marry a Christian girl, and why can't a Muslim woman Marry a Christian man. This is a problem faced by many of our youngsters over here in this multi-faith society. That, yes, there are reasons that how the children will be brought up, where in a Muslim society it is maybe a different story, but the faith, the, it is the man that plays the dominant role in upbringing of the children. And for that reason that says, okay, it is for her to uh, have the Muslim husband rather than her uh, another faith, then the children's faith would be divided or will create, be created more problem in that sense that if he is the bread winner or bread provider or provision maker in that sense, then the responsibility falls on the husband in most cases, in most societies. For God's, in God's wisdom that he has ordered, uh, ordered this, that this cannot be done the way we would like. So there are certain rules and restrictions from the divine perspective. For Pastor Tony, does 1 Timothy 3 prescribe that those with more than one wife must not be allowed leadership roles in the church. And then it goes into 1 Timothy 3. Was this to allow polygamists to do, join the church who already had more than one wife? Well, that's not fair. Does <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, in response to the first part of the question, 1 Timothy 3, that deals with who may be leaders in the church, yeah. particularly elders, those who are called to lead uh, the followers of Jesus. And there it's very clear that the one who is called to lead must be the husband of one wife. Now, that's been variously interpreted. Some say, well, that means for one to be a leader in the church, he must be married. Which, of course, means he has one wife. Others would say, well, maybe there was a context in those days where there were polygamous marriages, but only those who have one wife <coughs> may become leader in the church. With respect to the second part of the question, I know that's been much discussed in different parts of the world, I think in some of the African countries. And I know that uh, there have been long discussions, and sometimes it depends on the situation, but I'm not going to make any further comment on that at this point. Let's say, I know there have been situations where a husband was, uh, re the request was made of the husband to support the other wives, but to live with the one. I think that's a good orderly arrangement. Um, but may he be a leader in the church? I'm not going to answer that. Depends on the situation, I suppose. Um, I'd have to think further on that one. Next time. <laughs> okay, this is a question for both. What is the Muslim slash Christian view on birth control? Either one can speak first. <coughs> the 
family planning is permitted in Islam. Birth control as defined today means that no children at all know. Is family planning is spacing out children and limiting yourself to a certain number is also, although it's widely misinterpreted as to have as many children, but then you also have to look at the ability of the people that is both economically, emotionally, and physically able to raise those children. Otherwise, you're bringing children into the world that you cannot support, you cannot raise, you cannot do justice to them. Scholars have various interpretations, but it is permitted in Islam, family planning. So that is up to the each individual couple to decide on how to space the children, how to have, and how much they are able to bring, bring up together. In a fast-moving world today, many people restrict themselves to maybe two children or three. But there is nothing, no minimum number or maximum number is there. But again, in God, you will have, you will be answerable to God for raising those children, how many you bring into the world. And if you are doing injustice to the children, that you cannot support, that they are left on the street, for that for someone else to support, those kind of things God will question you. So it is up to the each and individual discussion on family planning aspect. I'm going to give two parts to that answer question. First, first is that the uh, Bible says that children are a gift from the Lord. So, enjoy them. Amen. Okay? Yeah. So, enjoy the children. Um, also, from the beginning, God said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. And... My understanding of that passage is to multiply, well, we should have at least, a couple should have at least two children to keep the status quo, but if you want to multiply, at least two and a half. <laughs> right? Three children. Right? Now, I know there's all kinds of circumstances, situations where sometimes it's not even possible. Sometimes maybe a situation where a family can only handle one or two. So there's emotional there's psychological, there's all kinds of situations, uh, and maybe I'm forgetting something here, but we have to look at those uh, things as well. But the third thing, um, I want to echo what my friend here was saying too, there also has to be a responsibility, right? Um, to say that I'm going to have, me and my wife are going to have 20 children, maybe that's physically possible, but is that responsible? And uh, there's that side of it as well. Um, when it comes to the question of birth control, that's my answer to it. It's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I might throw in an, another uh, supplement to the answer. The next question that might come from people who <laughs> have not come yet is about abortion. And abortion in Islam is not permitted except for the medical reason or any other reason that the uh, doctor can recommend or mostly health reason that within four months that abortion can be done if there is a really good reason and the reason again is up to the individual to see how things are. Nowadays the question comes and says about Down syndrome and other technology has advanced so much that people come with different questions and child will be born this well, it's up to God. If they believe that, yes, God can give the children, then that is an individual decision, not really anybody else's decision. That uh, And the woman has big say in this area, how, whether to have it or not. But otherwise, just for uh, about having a, uh, getting pregnant and abortion, that is not prohibited. Yeah, I mean. Okay, thanks a lot, Tom. Pastor Tony and uh, Dr. Abdul, this is all the questions we have at this time, unless there are still some circulating in the, the group. I'll hand the microphone over back to Art. Yeah? I'm not sure if uh, dinner is here yet, but uh, if it's not, then that's okay. We'll just mingle amongst each other um, before, we, uh, before we start dinner. And also when, uh, also, when it comes to the food, if we could have the, uh, the women and children uh, go first, that would be much appreciated. Thank you.
Okay. If anybody has any questions, any thoughts come later on and you want to send me my email is available with uh, the organizers here so you can always contact me. Well, thank you for, thank you for those uh, questions. And uh, we can also thank the Lord for bringing us for this occasion and also for the food that's coming. We may thank Him for that too. Let's, let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may know that you made this world and you made us all, all of us, in your image, male and female. And Lord, that is your glory and it's for your glory. Father, we acknowledge too, may we acknowledge that because of our sinfulness, because we broke the relationship with you. So much sadness has come into our world, into our marriages. But we thank you that in Jesus, you restore the gift of marriage to us again in a beautiful way. We ask, Lord, too, that you would bless our time together, that we may also receive the food with thanks we thank you for providing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.